Thank you all for coming this morning. And thanks to Joe uh, again for an awesome, awesome, awesome conference. Um, I think this worked out uh, excellently. Um, so thanks again for pulling this together. I'll be talking today about the subject of my chapter, which is the philosophy of money as it occurs in uh, Gertrude Elizabeth Margaret Anscombe. Um, so let's just roll into it. Um, Anscombe preferred to be addressed by her full name. Uh, there was a convention that developed in the latter part of the 20th century, middle part two as well as just calling her Elizabeth or Liz. I'm not sure where that came from, but uh, John McDowell once told me that I was to call her Gertrude Elizabeth Margaret Anscombe. If McDowell tells me to do it, I'm going to do it. A um, little bit of background on her. She was born in Limerick, Ireland on March 18th of 1919. Went to study philosophy uh, at Oxford in 1938. As soon as she got to Oxford, she began studying Catholicism and converted to Catholicism. So uh, although she was uh, born in Ireland, she was not born Catholic. She was a convert, and her conversion to Catholicism had uh, an immense uh, influence on both her um, the theology of her life, her personal life, obviously, but on her philosophical life as well. In um, ways that she was, I think, quite self-aware of and tried to guard against um, presenting too overtly when she knew her audience was going to be secular. Um, that theme may or may not uh, be important for the talk here. Um, she'll be engaging explicitly with Aquinas, so uh, the Catholicism will come out there. Uh, but just in case you don't know that about Anscombe, it's important for uh, the context of her, of her thought and her work. Um, she moved to Cambridge in 1942, where she met Wittgenstein. Uh, she and Wittgenstein immediately struck up a close relationship. Uh, she was the only English speaker that Wittgenstein trusted to translate his work uh, in his lifetime. So her first prominence um, came from being uh, Wittgenstein's uh, collaborator, confidant, and, and translator. She moved back to Oxford in 1946. Um, her most prolific years publishing were in the late 50s and early 60s. Um, she's left her mark on a variety of different fields in philosophy. Uh, I'm most engaged with her projects in practical philosophy, but she also um, wrote extensively in, in metaphysics on things like the metaphysics of time. She returned to Cambridge in 1970, where she retired, um, and she ended up, when she moved back to Cambridge, she took the same chair that Wittgenstein held there, and then she died in 2001. Okay, my essay that I'm going to be engaging with of hers comes from the year that she returned to Cambridge. In November of that year, she gave a lecture to the Philosophy Colloquium there called Philosophers and Economists, Two Philosophers' Objection to Usury. It is included in this volume here, Faith in a Hard Ground. Um, the volume is part of a series that St. Andrew's Press put out, I think, starting about 10 years ago, um, which is to date the most uh, extensive and authoritative collection of her works. It's not exhaustive, but it does include unpublished essays such as this one. In this essay, Anscombe's task is to hate. Um, Anscombe's task is to answer this question, which in her characteristic writing, it doesn't come up until about the 10th or 11th paragraph after she's well into her subject. Uh, uh, it takes you a while to figure out what she's after. But here's what she says. She wants to know, how is it that the Catholic Church, which condemned usury in unretractable terms as late as 1745, should have fallen silent uh, about it? And further, how is it that all econ to all economists, the objection makes complete nonsense? And she means nonsense literally here. It's not that uh, the, the economists uh, regard the arguments against usury from the medieval period uh, and into the modern period as uh, wrongheaded, uh, intelligible, but wrong, something like that. Uh, she reads or takes them to be uh, responding to the medieval objection as if it were literally absurd. And she can't get her head around why economists would think it is absurd. Um, because to her, it is clear-minded. So she wants to uh, sort of lay out the grounds for that, <clears throat> understand what the terms of the debates are, and uh, see if she can detect where contemporary economists find absurdity and what was so clear to the medievals. Uh, she says, the interest of these questions has led me to do some slight research, not high class, 
mainly I fear secondary or tertiary sources of which I will give the results. So the essay is a little breezy, um, which creates space for doing the kind of work that I'll be doing for Joe's volume, um, digging in a little bit deeper, trying to flesh out the details and maybe even doing some interpretive work. Okay, so um, I had the fortune of being able to go to the Anscombe archive, which is now located at the University of Pennsylvania this past March. And I found a notebook from 1970 uh, that uh, would have been written in at the time that she was composing this essay um, that she would be delivering. There was disappointingly little in that notebook to help me understand the context of why she is talking about this at all in 1970. Um, her conversations with her fellow uh, her economists at both Oxford and Cambridge at the time. But I did find this one quote, which is interesting. And um, uh, I, I introduce it to note something that I, I would like to get more into in the essay, but I don't think I'll be talking about much today. She has this quote from Marx, and I, I don't think she quotes Marx very much anywhere else. And it says, the human essence is no abstraction inherent in each single individual, in its reality, it is the ensemble of social relations. Um, in the essay, she concludes by talking about the, uh, the necessity of communism. So she's, she's clearly engaged in thinking somehow uh, about Marx's thought in the background, but it really only pops out at, at the end. Um, but this idea that uh, the human essence is uh, social relations, which is familiar to us from Marx, I think is quite important for her practical philosophy as well. So that is, if you want to hear more about that in the Q&A, you're welcome to. It'll end up being a part of my essay. But today, um, I'm going to set that aside and just focus on the arguments of usury, uh, arguments about usury, because they're strange enough on their own terms. OK, so here's what I'm going to do today. I'm going to review Anscombe's analysis, Aristotle's and Aquinas's view on money and usury. I'm then going to connect those remarks uh, up to thoughts more generally about the ontology of money. I will then review Anscombe's analysis of the economist's view of usury and suggest connections between her remarks on money and her broader political philosophy at the end. And when I do that, I'll point to an essay that um, is one of the few other places that she mentions money. And that essay is one of her more popular ones. So. Uh, it is a, it's a good one to discuss for Joe's volume. All right. Did I leave my water back there? Does anyone see where my water bottle is? I'm hiding it from myself. Great. OK. Um, I'll handle this rather quickly since uh, we're at day three of this conference. We probably heard about Aristotle's view of money and usury on more than one occasion already. So Aristotle treats money as an artifact. Unsurprisingly, it is an artifact. The contrast class here is a natural kind. Um, being an artifact, although for Aristotle, this would be true of species as well, <clears throat> the money is defined by its telos. What is the telos of money according to Aristotle? In the politics, a uh, view that um, potentially differs from the view in the ethics. Uh, Stefan Eich has got a book on this it's got a chapter on this in a book that just got released that I think the world of, so I highly recommend uh, everyone read Stefan's book, which just came out. Um, but in the politics anyway, the uh, account of money that Aristotle gives uh, and its tale is, it goes as follows, uh, through importing what they needed and exporting their surplus, people increasingly got their supplies from more distant foreign sources. Since not all the natural necessities are easily transportable, the use of money had of necessity to be devised. So this isn't exactly a double coincidence of wants story, but it's in the vicinity, right? Uh, uh, market transactions are cumbersome if you're transporting like cows or barrels of beer or something like that back and forth. Money is far more convenient as a medium of exchange because of its uh, portability, the way that it can contain value in small form. And that's what Aristotle says in the politics. So the telos, according to the politics, is to serve as a medium of exchange. In this section of the politics, Aristotle goes on to, to discuss usury and that, um, I don't know, it seems to be his primary concern. The, our account of money seems to be in service of the discussion of usury, not the other way around. I, uh, and here's what he has to say about usury. So money's proper use because of its telos is to ameliorate at least some of the inconveniences of exchange. Other uses of money are thus deviant. There is a proper use of money defined by its function other uses are improper. 
So one example that's not Aristotle's is gambling. Uh, I grew up in Louisville, Kentucky, and horse betting is part of the culture. It's what you do with your family sometimes, Thanksgiving Friday, Saturday afternoon, um, not deviant where I come from. But for Aristotle, I think the fact that money used in a gambling situation is not being used as a medium of exchange, but be, is being used as a form of entertainment or speculation to hoard more value, that's not what money is for. So there's something wrong about using money that way, judged against what its function is. Another example, which is Aristotle's example in this, uh, in this part of the politics, is that lending money out at interest is, uh, is deviant. Again, you're not, when you're, if you're lending money out to make more money through recovering interest on it, you're not using money as a medium of exchange. You're using it as a vehicle to grow itself. That's different than using it as a medium of exchange. So there's something uh, uh, apparent, uh, uh, um, deviant about that. Um, okay, so Aristotle says, hence usury is very justifiably detested since it gets wealth from money itself rather than from the very thing money was despised to facilitate. For money was introduced to facilitate exchange, but interest makes money itself grow bigger. Hence, of all kinds of wealth acquisition, this one is the most unnatural. I think the best metaphor is cancer, right? Think about how a, a cancerous tumor is a growth that is um, outside of the bounds of whatever the tissue is naturally supposed to do uh, according to natural selection. Um, I think Aristotle thinks of money growing via usury in the same way. It's a sort of cancerous uh, growth of money. All right. <clears throat> so here's what Anscombe has to say when she reads Aristotle. Um, so her question now at this point of the essay, and this was right at the beginning, is what were the ancient and medieval prohibitions on usury? What were the arguments for them? She says, Aristotle's answer, answer is that there's something perverse about it. Money is a medium of exchange and can't be made the commodity bought or sold without, so to speak, going against its nature. So far, so good. She then says, textbookily, money is called a standard of value or unit of account, a medium of exchange and a store of wealth. We can see that it doesn't make sense to speak of a rent on a unit of account. I mean, that much makes sense, a unit of account it's uh, to be likened to an abstract measure like a meter or, uh, you know, an hour. It's just not the kind of thing that you could, it doesn't make sense to think about charging rent on it. It's a category mistake. Then she says, Aristotle's objection seems to be that you can't really speak of rent on a medium of exchange. Okay, so one thing I want to draw your attention to right here is that I think that that statement already reads Aristotle a little bit differently than the way that I presented him. I pre according to what I think is the straightforward reading of what's going on with Aristotle, it does make sense to speak of acquiring money by lending it out and getting interest back, um, just as it does make sense to speak about tissue um, becoming a cancerous growth. It happens. It's a phenomenon. So there has to be some sense to talking about it. It's just wrong because uh, both of those phenomena happen out of accordance with nature. But here, I think Anscombe is thinking that there is something slightly absurd about charging rent on a tool or charging rent on the kind of tool that money is. And I don't, A, I don't know why she reads Aristotle that way, B, if she's really reading Aristotle that way. Um, but I draw our attention to that potentially puzzling interpretation of Aristotle's text to um, signal that this is where she's going to go when she studies Aquinas' argument against usury, and that is to think that there's something met metaphysically impossible or absurd about the phenomena according to the way that Aquinas articulates what money is and what happens when it is used. Um, so that's just a, an attunement to what's going to come when we get to Aquinas. All right, so setting up Aquinas, she says, but someone might say, why not of rent on a store of wealth? The idea here being that um, setting aside the puzzle that I just raised about Aristotle, uh, it seems like Aristotle's argument against usury is aimed at money when money is conceived of under its medium of exchange function. But that argument doesn't seem to apply to money when we think of money as a store of wealth. So she's suggesting that if we think of money as a store of wealth, we're going to need a different kind of argument for usury to be problematic if that's something that we want 
to uh, advocate. And that's where she goes in discussing Aquinas. So <clears throat> Aquinas' discussions of usury occur in this, uh, well, he's got more than just this, but her focus is going to be on the Summa and the Secunda Secunde question 78, which concerns usury. And in fact, it contains several arguments about, about usury against usury, arguing that there's something wrong or unjust about usury. Um, if you're unfamiliar with the way that the Summa works, it advances theses, it considers objections to those theses, and then gives replies to those objections in order to defend what the original thesis is. So what I've got next that I'm going to read is uh, an objection that Aquinas considers to the claim that there's something problematic about usury. And the objection goes like this. Anyone may lawfully accept a thing which its owner freely gives him. Now, he who accepts the loan freely gives the usury. Therefore, he who lends may lawfully take the usury. The idea behind this response to Aquinas being that when you enter into a usurious contract, you do so on your own free will, you choose it, so you accept responsibility for the terms of the argument, so there can't be anything wrong because it's something that you chose. To which Aquinas responds, he who gives usury does not give it voluntarily simply, but under a certain necessity, insofar as he needs to borrow money which the owner is unwilling to lend without usury. All right, so in the background here, not mentioned explicitly in this particular exchange about the legitimacy or illegitimacy of usury, is the idea that Aristotle presents in book three of the ethics, where the talk is about what is the nature of choice, what's the nature of volition, and what kind of necessity attaches to willed and unwilled acts. And one of the examples that Aristotle considers at the beginning about whether an act is voluntary or not is uh, jettisoning cargo from a ship when it's under duress. And he asks, uh, he considers the question, is it voluntary or involuntary if the ship is going to go down and the only way to save it and to save the lives of the people is to throw all the valuable cargo overboard? And I mean, his answer is, well, that's kind of, kind of not, right? I mean, like the person who is jettisoning the cargo has a goal in mind, they're taking means to pursue the goal. So it's got all the hallmarks of volitional activity, but it's not the sort of thing that they would do except for the extraordinary circumstances of the boat you know, being at risk of, of going down. So <clears throat> that, that idea that there can be activities that are quasi volitional, but not straightforwardly volitional because of the surrounding circumstances is an argument that was very popular at medieval times about what's wrong about usury. The idea being that you would only accept a loan uh, under, the under usurious terms if you really, really had to. If you were a farmer and you were really hard up and needed money because the crop didn't come in, something like that. And Aquinas himself considers this reference uh, explicitly in the De Malo. Um, for more on this particular topic, there's a great chapter in Odd Langholm's The Legacy of Scholasticism and Economic Thought, which is uh, now like 25 years old. Um, that's where I'm getting all this information from. It's great discussion of this image in Aristotle and how it runs through the scholastic tradition. I bring all that up as a setup for noting that that's not the argument that Anscombe considers when trying to understand what she thinks to be is you know, what she thinks is the interesting uh, medieval argument against usury. She she just doesn't even address it. Instead, she turns to this one. Get a sip of water, and then we'll read it together. All right. This is the argument from Aquinas that she does consider. To take usury for money lent is unjust in itself, because this is to sell what does not exist. Metaphysical argument. You're selling something that doesn't exist. That's the problem with usury, according to Aquinas in this quote, and the one again that Anscombe will pick up. <clears throat> and this evidently leads to inequality, which is contrary to justice. In order to make this evident, thank you, because that's not evident at all to me to start off with. In order to make this evident, we must observe that there are certain things, the use of which consists in their consumption. We thus consume wine when we use it for drink, and we, uh, and we consume wheat when we use it for food. 
Wherefore, in such like things, the use of the thing must not be reckoned apart from the thing itself. And whoever is granted the use of the thing is granted the thing itself. And for this reason, to lend things of this kin is to transfer the ownership. Okay, that's the weird idea, but that's the key idea that for consumable goods like wine and wheat, there is no distinction between the thing itself and the use of the thing itself because of the kind of good it is. Uh, contrast class would be like a shovel or a lawnmower or something like that, right? When you use it, you don't use it up, you use it and it remains intact. Um, <laughs> Aquinas' example of the kind of thing that would serve as a contrast class, and they did have shovels, they didn't have lawnmowers, um, but he uh, instead talks about houses, which is in the next quote, sorry. Uh, let's finish this quote and then we'll get on to his talk about uh, renting the space in the house. Accordingly, if a man wanted to sell wine separately from the use of the wine, he would be selling the same thing twice. Or he would be selling what does not exist, wherefore he would evidently commit the sin of injustice. I think that for Aquinas, that is very, very close to theft, selling what does not exist. <clears throat> On like manner, he commits an injustice who lends wine or wheat and asks for double payment, namely one for the return of the thing in equal measure and the other the price of the use, which is called usury. All right, my bad, the, the quote about houses is, is coming up. Let's, uh, let's pause for a second and gloss Aquinas' argument um, as far as it stands right now. So suppose that I've got a case of wine in my basement or my closet or something like that, you come knock on my door and you need a bottle. So I give you one and it might be Aquinas wine that I give you um, for the night. The claim that is being made here is that the wine and the use of the wine are one and the same. There's a metaphysical identity between the two. So for to lend you the wine is to lend you the use. That's what I'm giving you, which just is Aquinas says to transfer ownership. Um, you know, those are Aquinas' words. Anscombe doesn't pick up on this bit of transferring ownership, but I'm, I'm wondering if this is uh, an important part of the argument or not. I'm not entirely sure. So because they are one and the same, I can't justly charge you for both. If were I to do so, I would be charging you for something that doesn't exist. Anscombe's formulation of this, this is her little phrase for um, uh, trying to identify what's distinctive about consumable goods here is that uh, this idea of using it up, to charge you for the use of the wine as well as the wine itself is usury because the wine is used by using it up. The kind of thing that it is, its characteristic or definitive use is used through being used up. That's just sort of a, a one way of defining what a um, consumable good is. All right, one thing to note here, which just came out in Daniel's talk yesterday, uh, and is something that I'd like to think more about in the course of writing this paper, is uh, the way that concern about risk gets left out of this. If you want to make the example of the lending of the wine sort of, um, I think, get the best grip on the idea that the fair thing to ask in response for giving a bottle of wine is to just get one of exactly the same kind and quality and quantity back, is to think about lending it one night and the neighbor shows back up the next day before you've had the opportunity to drain your wine cellar down and be, you know, unfortunately without wine, where the lending and the return involves minimal, if not no risk. Uh, because a natural thing that I think uh, an economist will say at this point is that Anscombe and Aquinas are just missing the importance of risk is uh, the kind of thing that one is paid for and compensated for in the, con in the context of charging some interest on, on a rent. Um, Anscombe doesn't discuss it at this part of the argument, but she does later in the paper. She calls risk a magic formula and a monstrosity. Um, and she seems to think that it was invented in the 16th or 17th century. So it was very interesting to learn from Daniel yesterday that there's discussion of uh, interest on loans being a payment for risk as far back as like the second century. Uh, that might just be a, a gate, a giant blind spot in her thinking about the matter. Um, okay. Back to Aquinas and his text. Here's the contrast class where now we're not thinking about consumable goods like wine, but instead are thinking about non-consumable goods like renting a room in a house. On the other hand, there are things the use of which does not consist in their consumption. For example, to use a house is to dwell in it, not to destroy it. Wherefore, in such things, both may be granted. For instance, one may hand over to another the ownership of his house, 
while reserving for himself, to himself rather, the use of it for a time or vice versa, he may grant the use of the house while retaining the ownership. Okay, so reading that quote, that's where the, uh, the ownership bit comes in, I guess, as opposed to transferring a consumable good where you give the ownership up, you let somebody live in your house, you don't give the ownership up. <clears throat> for this reason, a man may lawfully make a charge for the use of his house and besides this, revindicate the house from the person to whom he has granted its use, as happens in renting and letting a house. Okay, so we've got consumable goods. When you lend them out, you also lend up the use and the using it up. You transfer the right of ownership. On the other hand, we've got things like houses, where if you let a room, you don't give up the title to the room, you retain the title to the room. So when the person leaves, you get it back. It's not consumed the same way that a bottle of wine is consumed. <laughs> now to money. Aquinas says, according to the philosopher, uh, the philosopher is Aristotle, whose um, texts were just being translated in Aquinas's life. Um, so there's a much fervor uh, in Europe at the time about what this, uh, what this philosopher had to say. According to the philosopher, uh, money was invented uh, chiefly for the purpose of exchange. And consequently, the proper and principal use of money is its consumption or alienation whereby it is sunk in exchange. That's going to be the puzzling idea that uh, I'd love to get your all's two cents on. The principal use of money is its consumption or alienation whereby it is sunk in exchange. Hence, it is by its very nature unlawful to take payment for the use of money lent, which payment is known as usury. And just as a man is bound to restore other ill-gotten goods, so is he bound to restore the money which he has taken as usury. Again, that's the bit that I'm going to want us to focus on, and it's the bit that Anscom will focus on. Proper principal use of money is its consumption or alienation whereby it is sunk in exchange. All right, here's what she has to say about this particular argument against usury. Thomas says that the money, that money is a consumable good, which is used up and dispersed in being spent. That is, you are not to consider the money that you lent existing once someone has spent it, any more than a loaf once someone has eaten it. This enables us to answer the objection, why not a rent of a uh, sum of money as a store of wealth? Backing up, remember this is, what she's trying to do at this point is give an argument that intelligibly shows that there's something problematic with the idea of charging interest on money lent. When we're thinking of money under the guise of being a store of wealth. Aquinas himself mentions the medium of exchange function of money here, but Anscombe is thinking that it'll be more useful to apply that argument to thinking of money under its store of wealth function. The answer would be money as a store of wealth is comparable to seed as a store of crop life. So we've got an artifact, but we're, uh, which money is, but we're going to understand its characteristics by analogy to a natural kind, namely the seed from which you would grow anything that grows from a seed, wheat or something like that. Money as a store of wealth is comparable to seed as a store of crop life. Seed, like money, can be kept for a long time and used, up at, it, used at any time. But if the seed is used, that is planted to grow a crop, it dies and does not exist anymore. So you could ask for a share of the crop or a greater amount of seed if it is used to make more seed, but if it was just a loan of so much seed, all you can ask in an that would be equitable, that would be just, is the same quantity back. All right. <clears throat> so how is that comparison to money as a seed meant to answer the objection to usury? The argument that Anscombe glossed <clears throat> from Aquinas was meant to show that there is something problematic somehow with charging rent on a load of money when it's considered as a store of wealth or value. However, I don't know if you all had the same reaction that I had to thinking about the seed analogy. In spite of Anscombe saying that money is like a seed, isn't it exactly not like a seed um, <clears throat> or a bottle of wine in the relevant ways. That is, when I lend, she, she says, we're not to think of money as being the same money if I lend Joe uh, 
10 bucks and it's a $10 bill. I mean, she's thinking of money. Um, uh, I, th I think that she's thinking of money in, let me start that over. She's aware that a way of lending money would be to transfer a physical object um, and then to ask for something of the same kind as that physical object in return with a little more of that physical object. Um, if I give Joe 10 bucks um, and maybe I'm already beginning to see the answer to her, to her, to her, to her question now that I'm trying to state the problem out loud. It sure seems to me like if I, if I, if I give Joe some physical money and then ask for that money in return. Well, at the very least, the physical uh, bill that I give to Joe, if he goes on and spends it to someone else, and that person goes on and spends it to someone else, that bill is existing and circulating. And that seems to be a key idea to the charterless theory of money is that these uh, um, notes and, and uh, indications of debt can circulate, maintaining their integrity and the promise that they are made for. Um, and in their circulation, uh, generate economic activity, allow for the payments of, of various kinds of services, but that it's the it's the circulation of media that um, allows the whole system to work. She's uh, and in, and in that regard, um, money, the physical stuff of money, the bearer of monetary value, is very much not like a seed. Um, so I'm uh, and it, it only gets sort of more. Uh, the, the problem only crystallizes more when we think of, of physical coins and the metallic nature of coins rather than rather than bills. Um, <clears throat> I'm stuck at this point, as you can tell, as I'm starting to ramble a little bit. There, there does seem to be something counterintuitive and disanalogous uh, about thinking about seeds and money on the same footing. So if you all can help me get clearer about making defensible this idea that we should be thinking about, um, that, that there's something that Aquinas gets right when he says that money when it is used, is used up like a um, like a, a, a bottle of wine. It would help me better understand the argument. Go ahead, Jordy. I'm sorry. Uh, do you have in mind the type token distinction here? Type token distinction. Or material versus something. Yeah. So let me think. I guess maybe that does matter, right? Because if I lend you, she talks about I think a lawnmower is her example of a thing that 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 could possibly be lent. Be something strange if I lent you my lawnmower and you return me someone else's lawnmower, um, where it's of the same type but a different token. Whereas that's what happens all the time with money, right? It would, in fact would be very odd if you gave me back exactly the same ten dollar bill. Okay, that's helpful. Maybe that makes this view a little bit more intelligible. That it's extremely rare when we return payments on money that we return exactly the same tokens precisely for the same reason that it would be very odd if I lent you a bottle of wine that you gave me exactly the same bottle back the next day. Like, well, why'd you need it last night? Why didn't you drink it? Okay, that's helpful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, go ahead, Zoli. Yeah, so I have this, this may be a non sequitur, but it's um, something else to add to the mix. I think, I mean, Aristotle thinks that coins are like seeds in the following sense, that if you, if I borrow a seed from you, I can I can plant some arugula, let some of it go to seed, right? So one seed produ can produce more, right? Um, and a coin can do that if I invest my money, I can get back. So they, they produce offspring or interest in a way that the wine doesn't. Okay, but Ar wait, Aristotle Aristotle thinks that money, if it's functioning that way, is deviant, right? Yes. Oh, okay, good, 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 good. Okay, so the I see. I see. Does he explicitly explicitly make that scene metaphor at any point? I mean, he does say that interest is like offspring, and there's some Greek pun or something like that yeah. going on there. Yeah, I mean, um, so, yeah tokos it means interest or offspring. Right. Um, but right. I mean, in the in the lead up to the usury stuff, there's all this stuff, all this stuff about like the nutrition provided for an embryonic chick within the egg, and um, in the in the politics, he's yeah. talking about that kind of stuff. Okay, great. All right, maybe then Anscombe is like way closer to the text than I than I realized. Um, go ahead. Are we in the Q and A already? No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I said uh, practically. I'll wait then. <laughs> yeah, great. It would, it would I would appreciate that. But you all, thanks thanks for those comments. This is uh, this is why we give presentations like this. This is already really helpful. Um, okay, so <clears throat> back to Anscombe now. Her last paragraph on Aquinas and Aristotle before turning to. Joe, how long do we have till till ten thirty? Is that? I think they'll start coming up at ten thirty. Okay, great. Up. All right, let me let me clip along here. Um, 
this is the last thing she says before she transitions to her discussion of uh, the contemporary economist for whom uh, these considerations about usury um, are apparently absurd. She says, isn't it interesting that those philosophers to whom money was certainly physical gold and silver should have refused to regard it as a permanent commodity, but said that it was no such thing, concentrating on the character in regard to which it is an abstraction. Um, whereas we, to whom money really is practically nothing but a mental construction, should be so clear that it is a permanent commodity. Um, I think there's an, an insight here. Uh, I think it's certainly the case that theorizing about money in the 20th century by many economists is bizarre as the world moves off the gold standard, uh, economists continuing to be anchored to gold standard thinking, thinking that there has to be some kind of material underpinning to the value of money and being very reluctant to completely let go of that thought and think about money as um, an expression of or connected to a representation of something like that, of social relations. Um, it seems like there's lots of people at this conference who are both comfortable with that thought and know of the thinkers who were thinking along those lines. But there are a lot of economists that were still clinging to, uh, even if they knew that the gold standard was dead, operating on a sort of gold standard uh, model in the back of their minds. It's the kind of thing that I think is uh, properly subject for a kind of genealogical critique that Nietzsche gives and the genealogy of morals on holding on to things that are dead in one's thoughts and reasoning even after history has left it, left it go past. So I think she's on to something here, both about in her own day and about the using up business, um, that there being potentially an insight and a way of thinking about money as an abstraction that Aquinas is on to that maybe even makes it a, a little hard for us to read him properly. So um, I, 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 uh, I think this is a, a thought-provoking quote. And here are some more reasons why I think it's a thought-provoking quote. The idea that money's use requires its alienation, which is used by using it up. I don't see it in Aristotle, though maybe Zoli's going to get me to think a little bit more about seeds and the like to see that it's... Uh, well, no, again, that's for him, it's the deviant use, right? I really think that he thinks that uh, money is like a hammer, right? It's that kind of, that kind of tool. Um, but maybe I'm wrong. Anyway, Anscombe seems to think that it uh, seems to be right that Aquinas' argument against usury differs from Aristotle's and the difference seems to turn other differences on money's ontology. That is a throw it out there for the conversation, the Q&A. Um, now, one of the things that I think is interesting about this Aquinas idea of money it's use being, uh, it's um, uh, one of the phrases that he use, uses in describing what it is to use money is it says that it's used uh, properly when it's alienated, right? Most bits of private property, when you use them, qua property, you don't alienate yourself from them, as in where alienation here means turning over the property right to somebody else, right? When I'm using my lawnmower as my lawnmower, it's mine and I'm using it and I retain the property right to it while I mow my lawn, and then I put back in the garage and my property right sticks to it throughout. Money's use requires that you give up your right to it and transfer it to someone else. And this idea sticks around in the European tradition for centuries. Kant's discussion of money in the metaphysics of morals starts from the idea that money is used by alienating it. Um, that's where, that's the first, you know, Kant calls it a nominal definition, but it's the starting point for an analyzing what the nature of money is. He credits this to uh, Gottfried Achenwald, who I think was a jurist of the time. So this seemed to be the commonsensical way of thinking about what money was, at least in Kant's Prussia in the 18th century. Money is uh, uh, this odd thing whose characteristic use is, uh, involves the giving up of the right to it, which is unlike just about any and perhaps any other kind of property. But then I, I don't know of this idea maintaining itself into the 19th century. Um, seems to disappear from the best of, from what I can tell in the sort of Smith tradition and then Marx react, re reacting to Smith. Um, uh, Frank's got something to tell me about that. I would love to, love to hear it. Uh, I, it seems to me like it disappears. So that, that's also just kind of a historical curiosity that the idea sticks around for a long time and then seems to die off. Um, also, a possible reason for the medieval comfort with abstract money, people were very familiar with it, even in the absence of central paper bank money. Uh, Rory Naismith has got a nice book on, uh, on this that, that addresses this, uh, this topic. Okay, we've only got a half an hour. Let me, I'm going to do this at a, a little bit faster clip so that there's plenty of time for Q&A. 
So now she moves on to trying to figure out why her contemporary uh, economist friends at Cambridge and Oxford can't make any sense of this um, uh, objection to usury. She says, how is it that the Catholic Church, which condemned usury in unretractable terms as late as 1745, fell silent about it? And further, how is it that all economists, to all economists, the objection makes complete nonsense? Um, now, the nonsense that she think where what she thinks the economists find nonsensical is the following idea distinguishing the return the idea of getting a return on investment which is uh, a legitimate thing to pursue with one's uh resources and wealth from getting an interest on loan which is by definition usury um the economists that she's talking about find this distinction absurd or find or excuse me find the claim absurd because there is no real distinction there is no difference between seeking to get a return on investment of one sort and getting um, a return on a, a user's return on a loan. No difference between the two of them. She says, I remain perplexed by the utter failure of economists to see any point in the objection to usury, for it appeared to me that I could understand well enough the distinction between investing in a capital venture with a view to sharing the profits if it should succeed on the one hand and demanding interest on the mere strength of a loan on the other. Like, I, looks like there's a pretty clear difference to me. Why don't economists see the difference. So she talks to her fellow economists. She can't figure anything out. She tries reading some Keynes. She can't figure anything out. But then she stumbles upon Ricardo and says, aha, I think that I've, I understand what's going on here. And she labels the phenomena the shop window effect. How exactly this comes out of Ricardo, I don't know. But the phenomena of the shop window effect is, uh, is what I want to draw our attention to. So she says, imagine that you're walking down the street and you see a store that has a certain kind of coat in the shop window. And lo and behold, the store right next to it has got exactly the same sort of coat um, for sale also in the window. Well, the two stores really can't charge very different amounts for the two coats because if they're wildly out of sync, you're just going to go buy the cheaper coat. I mean, they're exactly the same kind of coat uh, unless the one store is just massively more pleasant to be in. Uh, your uh, economic rationality dictates that they're close at hand. You know, imagine that you're Beridian's ass, right? They're like equally distant from one another, except you're not Beridian's ass because one of the things is obviously better to do than the other, go buy the cheaper coat. So when choices have this kind of structure, the deciding factor will often will be, um, the, the rationality would demand, is that you maximize the return on your investment. Here, spend less money on the coat so that you've got more money left over to spend on other stuff. Now, Anscombe's thought is that economists, uh, since Ricardo, theorize about the entire world as if every uh, decision is a shop window decision. And she says that this provides a picture in which the obvious thing to do with money, because every situation is a shop window decision where you're going to try to maximize the return that you've got on the money that's in your pocket, is to lay it out uh, to make as much money as markets allowed if we're thinking about getting using money to grow money as opposed to using money to buy the best and most stuff with it, um, be most effective with the spending of money to acquire consumer goods. Anything else would be conscious extravagance or conscious philanthropy, et cetera. So it's not like the economist of her day don't recognize um, the failure of individuals and maybe the self-conscious failure of individuals to get as much money in return for their investments as they possibly can. But in, in labeling some of these activities as uh, uh, extravagance or conscious uh, philanthropy, she flags that it's, there's a sense in which it's irrational to behave this way. Whereas, she says, it would seem to me proper to think that if you had some spare money, that it would be reasonable to do something else, like building a house, just because a house was required in this place and was part of your function when you had the disposal of some spare money to do that sort of thing with it. Okay, now this claim, I think, is only intelligible in the context of her broader theory about what practical reasoning uh, is, which comes out in her masterwork, Intention. In that book, uh, about two-thirds of the way through, she's discussing what the form of a practical syllogism is like. She thinks that one of the things that has been lost, that she blames Descartes, but like all of modern philosophy is to blame. We need to go back to Aquinas and, and uh, Aristotle to think clearly on these matters, she says, 
is to try to understand practical reasoning on the model of theoretical reasoning. She, and she thinks formally that theoretic, practical reasoning and theoretical reasoning are different from one another in a variety of ways. One of the ways in which they are different is, is what can occur as the major premise in a bit of practical reasoning. Um, the contrast class is a theoretical syllogism where a universally quantified statement could serve as the major premise. All ravens are black, uh, all dogs are mammals, something like that. She says, in practical reasoning, we never, or extremely rarely, rather, have major premises of that sort. When we do, they're pro pro prohibitory um, uh, premises. Um, it is irrational to kill oneself or something like that. So um, never jump off a cliff without a, a parachute might be a, 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 a major premise that could occur in practical reasoning formulated in that universal form. But by and large, when we're pursuing uh, the kinds of goals that we pursue in our life, we do so under major premises that don't have that universalized form. Instead, what we pursue when we pursue the goals that we pursue in life occur under descriptions of the following sort. <clears throat> Aristotle says they occur under descriptions that characterize the thing pursued as what we should pursue. And then she doesn't say very much about should um, and where, where the shoulds would come from in intention. Instead, she focuses on the next um, two, which are that a thing is characterized as pleasant in some way, or that it's characterized as suitable in some way. And it's the suitability that I think is of really of interest to her because this is what fits into what will later uh, be born out of this text called virtue ethics. Um, that what the kinds of things that we pursue in the course of our practical activity, when they're not governed by shoulds, and when they're not done for the sake of pleasure, and she thinks that pleasure is way more bizarre than many of us tend to think, we do it because it suits the kind of being that we are. It either suits the kind of being that we are qua human, or it suits the kind of being that we are qua member of the various kind of community that we belong to, but that uh, we're just doing what suits the sort of person that we are. Again, these are what occur in the first terms of practical syllogisms. In this book, she is hellbent not to let her um, Catholic theology and her Catholic system of values infect the way that the discussion goes. So when she's trying to present an example of what, or excuse me, when she presents an example of what a suitability characteristic is like, she picks the Nazis, just um, thinking like, well, no one's, no one's going to be confused and thinking I'm making a moral claim about suitability if I talk about what it suits a Nazi to do on his dying day. Um, <clears throat> so one of the points that she wants to make about what it would suit a Nazi to do on his dying day and how the con conception that the Nazi has of what's, what is so suitable, A, can affect uh, his activity, guide his activity rationally, but B, also be the sort of thing that you could argue the Nazi out of, is to consider something else that would be suitable for the Nazi to do. So um, she imagines the Nazi getting ready on his dying day to do something horrendous, blow up school. Um, you might, uh, she says, point out that it would also suit a Nazi to spend his dying day singing, you know, patriotic songs or something like that. Um, bringing the activity that the Nazi is to perform under uh, uh, what would be suitable as a major premise in reasoning about the activity that is to be performed. Okay, <clears throat> so what she is thinking here is that from the capitalist mindset, um, it is suitable to view all decisions as in the shop window, as attempts to maximize profit, because that's what a good capitalist does. But that is just one description that one can be brought under. It's not uh, uh, something that is, um, uh, I don't know, an, an intrinsic or necessary part of, of human nature. There are other kinds of groups to which one could belong or descriptions that one could put oneself under that would make it suitable to do something else with one's money, with one's excess money, rather than simply try to invest it to make as much money as possible. What might those other things do? Well, again, her example was you might just build a house because it's what it suited you to do. Um, okay, so how then does the medieval argument against usury come to seem absurd? Uh, the argument predisposes a distinction between a return on investment and a return on a loan. That distinction is supposed not to exist. They're supposed to be one and the same. Anscombe says that the distinction only seems like it does not exist when all decisions are assumed to be in shop window decisions. That is, when what it suits one to do is what it suits capitalists to do. 
but sometimes it suits one to make shop window decisions, and other times it might suit one to do something else. I take that to be the upshot of her argument here when she's talking about it might suit one just to build some houses. Uh, it's off stage at that point, but I think that that's what's going on in the argument. All right. But what I want to talk about is, does any of that help with the idea that money is used up when it is spent? We've only got 20 minutes. Um, I'm going to skip this last bit, but I guess I'll put the slide up. She also talks about money in um, a, one of her more famous essays on brute facts. Uh, there's, I don't think that there's that much that comes out in this discussion in on brute facts that will uh, illuminate this particular question that I really want to want to get on to. There, she makes the uh, point that she gets from Wittgenstein that all practices must be um, understood against the backdrop of institutions in which they occur, and that it's impossible to give an exhaustive uh, description of all those institutions in the attempt to articulate what the content of a sentence made in the given practice is. Um, I think all of that is right. I think it all fits with the view, but I don't think it answers the, the question about using up seed and the like, and I, I really would like to hear more about that. So, um, damn it, what is my point that Anscom says in the middle of a, of a notebook? I don't know how often you all hit that point where you're just going and going and going and going. You can't figure out what you're saying anymore. Uh, I loved reading this when I got that in the notebook, so I will leave that up and see if I can figure out my point. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I really enjoyed this. Um, uh, I want to uh, just, you probably know, but um, uh, I, I find it always very useful to look into those scholars who look into the uh, sort of the legal functioning of all those things. Okay. And one of those scholars who does this is, uh, we talked about him yesterday, uh, Henry Dunning McLeod. Uh, in his uh, book on credit, uh, he writes a little bit on the distinction between mutuum and commodatum, which is exactly what you're talking about, you know, goods. Uh, that must be consumed in being used and goods that don't have to be consumed in being used. And he makes distinctions about what it means to transfer these goods. And I think this is taken from uh, Roman civil law. Okay. And I think those distinctions are so well developed in Roman civil law because, you know, it's not just, you know, people thought about this, well, would have thought, thought about this, but, you know, they really had to figure this out because their livelihoods depended on it. And what, sort of- What were the, what were the Latin words again? Mute, mute? Mutuum and commodatum. Commodatum. Okay. And so- uh, the uh, uh, and these, uh, I think the, the points are all exactly right. I just want to point you to, to one thing where I think that uh, so the, the, the question might go away. So uh, so there's two things that you can you can say about a mutuum. Uh, it uh, it it cannot be used without being consumed, uh, and it cannot be used uh, without being owned. You know the same. It would you know in, in if I rent a car. You know, uh, and uh, I return a different car. You know, somebody would uh, be very upset uh, because I didn't just, uh, you know, get a car as a as a mutuum, but as a commodatum. And if I if I get an egg and I return the same egg, as you said, you know, somebody uh, wouldn't be confused. Right now, uh, I think that for me, the the whole issue gets resolved when you think, okay, if if I have to transfer ownership in the exchange, uh, then it's not that I'm giving you something. And I'm expecting that something to be around at some point again, the money, because you know that person has to own that money. So it's again, not it's mine the, anymore. Where did the, the type token distinction matters here, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're not. And yeah. So the I think the the way to look at this is the exchange takes place at that moment. So the the question we need to answer is what do I get for my money at that moment? And it's not that I get something back later. I get something at that moment. And what do I get? I get a chosen action, right? I get a, a right of action against the person who has my money. Right. But it's something that I own now. The person, the person fully owns the money that I gave him because otherwise they couldn't do anything. And I it. fully own a claim on them for and whatever it is. And I fully own the chosen action. I mean, of course, that was only developed. I think uh, Commons talks about this in um, uh, institutionalism. Uh, Who's that? Uh, um, uh, what's his first name? Um, Robert Commons. Uh, uh, he, he wrote, I think, two, two books that, uh, uh, one is Legal Foundations of Capitalism, that I sometimes search, but then uh, Institutionalism. And there, there's a large discussion. He also uh, describes uh, MacLeod as one of the first sort of institutionalists who has figured out the credit theory of money. Mm -hmm. sort of in the yeah. 400 to 500 pages, uh, there's a long discussion <laughs> uh, uh, how we sort of invented uh, transferable choses in action 
uh, to meet certain economic needs. But the, the general idea is a chosen action can be owned. And so with that, the exchange takes place at that moment. So what I get is a chosen action from the other person, a right of action against that person. You know, what, what, your what you get from your bank if you put in $50, you know, they fully own the $50, you fully own a chosen action against the bank. And now you can ask yourself, okay, but why aren't they worth the same thing? You know, why isn't the, why is the one thing a chosen action uh, uh, for $55? Because maybe it's, you know, a bond with interest. And why is the other one a $50 uh, bill? But that's, I think that's a totally different question because, it, you know, the, the ontological problem has been solved, you know. There's nothing missing here or, you know, there, I'm, I'm doing, I'm, 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 uh, I'm, I'm getting something for something that doesn't exist. Of course these things exist. They're just two legal entities. One is the money entity, the other is the shows and action, action entity. And then you can ask yourselves, okay, why aren't they worth the same thing? But you could say they are worth the same thing because $50, uh, a, 50, a $50 note is exactly worth as much as uh, an IOU from uh, from you that I'm getting right now, and you know that then you know what I can if there's risk involved and what I can do with the money and if it can use be used productively, I think all this is sort of uh, talk that can can happen down the road. But I think the sort of the important thing is to say that yeah, they're ex they're really exchanging ownership at that moment, and somebody gets something else uh, at that moment. I awesome. Think, I don't think the the, the riddle is resolved because it still doesn't make sense in the ancient world that a quantum you give away becomes in time more. And the argument, although the Christian argument throughout modernity was <clears throat> this is irrational or that doesn't make sense or it's a crime against God because I'm. And how is it possible that even if you give someone this 50 bucks, the right to action with it for a year and then you get it back with more money or- You don't get it back. You have a right to action again. That's it, end of the deal. That, and the, the money doesn't become more. The fifty, if it's if it's gold money, it's just somewhere else. It does something else. Yeah, but, the, but, but the question of interest and usury was: Why can someone ask to get more money back? Why can you? Why is interest interest and usury was not never justified till cap, till you can make a capitalist action? And only if you make an investment, which is not a coat or a bottle of wine or a seed but only if you invest in the commodity labor power, according to Marx, then it's justified because then in time, in fact, a quantum can become more. And this is why he says the interest rate is connected on the long term, on the long run to the profit rate. That can be, and it's not possible for an economy for a long term to have a higher interest rate than the profit rate because the all, all forms of income, maybe derivatives may be, uh, from housing market, from whatever, in, in the last instance, our share from exploiting the commodity labor power, which is which is the only commodity which is an, 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 an equivalent and a non-equivalent. Equivalent because it gets enough from his work to reproduce itself, and non-equivalent because there's surplus value which gets exploited, which is this specific quantum with, which only in capitalism justify to get money back and ask for more money, which in in all, in all previous forms, did not really make uh, uh, did not really make sense. Can you just say one sentence? Oh, sorry, please, no, no, no. I'm, I am benefiting from this, so keep keep going. <laughs> uh, uh, so this may all be true in sort of in the larger scale of talking about what capitalism works like, but I don't think it it th this is necessarily tied to the metaphysics of exchanging legal entities like these choices and actions. You could, you could think about an, of an exchange of entities. You know, I work, uh, you know, I work on your field tomorrow for one hour and you work on my field for two hours next year. And then you could say, well, why, you know, why is there, you know, why does my labor multiply? Why has it grown? It hasn't grown. You know, there's just two legal entities that we made up uh, and they, you know, we may argue about whether they have different values or not different values. You know that's that's all very interesting, but it's it, you know nothing nothing got bigger or smaller or added or hasn't got, gotten added. You know it, there's just an exchange of you know one hour for two hours, and then you can start with the reasons why the two hours. There's nothing you know there's nothing that has grown or or valorized. It's just uh, it's just it's it's just an ex exchange of uh, legal entitlements. And of course, you know, I agree. Of course, in capitalism, the legal entitlements that go along with capital work in a very specific way. But I think. Uh, that's uh, sort of that's that's a uh, that's a uh, that's an issue that's a little more sort of 
uh, detail than the more general metaphysical issue that's at stake here, isn't it? What? Go ahead, Joe. This is just to clarify on Anscombe's behalf, just to make sure. So what Simon is um, describing as a legal entity, would Anscombe describe that as non-existent? So I'm confused with exactly what she means by saying um, what's sort of wrong with usury is that it's basically selling something that doesn't exist. But so what, but, and what Simon is saying is if you consider something as a legal claim, um, and you consider that to exist, then basically the, the contradiction is mm -hmm. there. But I don't, I don't know what Anscombe means by saying something. One of the things that, um, giving this particular presentation this time <laughs> around has made me realize that I find really hard to track is when, um, when she's reading these folks and for them themselves, when the argument is a metaphysical argument and when it's an argument about justice and what the difference between the two of those is, right? Because you, okay, so one thing you might say is that um, I take it that Simone is, is suggesting that there's nothing metaphysically askew about interest if we realize that <clears throat> I've transferred the ownership of the money um, in making a loan and that like that transaction is done, the money has moved, moved on. And so whatever I get in return is just an entirely separate action. The idea of like something metaphysically mysterious about the money growing on its own requires some kind of ontological mistake to think it's the same money that was returned but is turned into something new. It's a, just, it's a different point in time. It's a different contract if you want to think of it that way. So it can be whatever the hell it wants to be. Um, then the argument is not that there's anything metaphysically weird about that, but that it's unjust because I've gotten more than what I gave up and there's a lack of equivalence and the justice about balance and equivalence. Um, but, you know, uh, so, so, but she, she seems to th herself want to make and... I mean, Aquinas does say that that the, um, this particular thought about usury is charging rent on which that on that which does not exist. Um, I mean, I don't know. Maybe at which point the 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 met <laughs> I'm, I'm, today I'm inclined to think that that's just bad metaphysics and it's the wrong way to to think about what's going on. Um, even if there is something to her later thoughts about shop windows and suitability characteristics. And we don't always have to be uh, profit maximizing capitalists all the time. That seems like entirely separate from this point about uh, the metaphysics of usury. Is that what you were suggesting about yeah. the, like yeah. once it's given and the property right is done, like that's one transaction, it's just over. Whatever happens later can yeah. be whatever it is, yeah. right? Yeah, um, in which case, uh, yeah, the argument is all about justice. It doesn't have anything to do with metaphysics. But this is only the credit theory of money, which I totally agree. But the riddle is, but how can something, how a quantum can become a bigger quantum? What is, what is the, the quality of the bigger? How can we so exploit a quantum? Because we're product, we're productive. We're here yeah, in we capitalism. We create. But in capitalism, but for the Greek and and for the whole Christian tradition, it doesn't make sense because it wasn't a capitalist society, so it was okay to ask only the same amount back, but not more. And if you ask more, then you assume that the quantum became more and they ask, what is this? In time, it has become more, but the time, whatever you have done with your action, this time belongs to God and God cannot make from 10, 15, uh, or if, if God decides so, then it's God's will. But they had no clue why, what is it what makes from 10, 15? And this is, so according to Marx, or also according to, to their different so explanations where uh, profit comes from. So mainstream bourgeoisie or economists say it's just so risk or uh, because so you one doesn't take the money, the other one uh, gets it so that it's okay to, as, as you said, to, to pay him this, this time where he, where he can make some action. But also the, the amount which comes out, why is it... Why is the interest so 10? Why is it not 100 or a million? Is there, there must be so a specificity in this, in this uh, quantum. Why is it okay to ask for 2%? Why is it absurd to ask for 1 billion? And so there must be so, uh, so what money is invested into. And that was different from just invest, invested in, I don't know, in risky enterprises or invested into a, a, a peasant who had uh, problems, or invested in commodified uh, labor time and commodified means of production, which is the only way to justify that something uh, 
that in time something that you can extract the quantum of time, so to say. Um, I saw Scott next, but Frank, can I ask real quick, the why wouldn't some, I mean, Locke already has a labor theory of value, which makes the very commonsensical idea. Like if I spend some time weeding the land and getting the weeds out, I'm going to grow more crops than if I didn't do that. So if we're talking about how productivity could increase with labor, how there could be more. And if money is somehow a representation of the greater stuff that has come about as a function of labor, it doesn't seem like you need full-blown capitalism to think about there being a connection between um, industry and the rational use of labor and getting more stuff. Um, what, what, what does capitalism add to the picture that the labor theory of value doesn't give you in terms of like how we get more stuff? Because you, you buy and sell commodity labor power. It's not labor time, which is so uh, represented by money or which is represented by profit. It's only the buying and selling of the commodity labor power. Okay. And this is also why Marx is totally different from Smith and Ricardo. He does not say labor creates value or the labor is embodied in the value of the commodity. He says the only productive commodity is to buy and sell the commodity labor power because there is an equivalent and a non-equivalent. And this difference you can exploit and extract. And this is a surplus. Okay. The labor, the labor theory of value from Smith and Ricardo is totally different from labor class. In a way, it's not a labor uh, theory of value. Yeah, of course, the whole tradition of Marxism get uh, interpreted it that way, but it's it's wrong. Mark, in, in some passages, Marx say crystal clear that labor has absolutely no value. It creates in a well value, but what 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 is buying and sold is only the commodity labor power, and this is what, why it's different from peasant work or slave work or independent free work because there was already labor, but it. A labor theory of value and a profit was not doesn't make sense in this form of social relation of using uh, or, 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 of of working. Great, Scott. I'm sorry, I I, I long ago lost the track. <laughs> but, uh, oh, go ahead. Sorry. I, I'm so. What is the explanandum? What is it that we're trying to? What is it that what is it that we're trying to explain? Is it the existence of usury or the existence of interest? Is she using interest and usury? synonymously i i mean yeah so she is using so she's in the in the uh classical ancient sense she's using uh interest and usury synonymous synonymously or at least the idea of interest on the strength of a loan and uh nothing else okay. that that's usurious well i mean i just you know does she talk at all about the time preference theory of interest i mean on one view of interest it's just payment for on one view of interest, we all prefer to get goods in the near future, right? So uh, lending someone, whether it's goods or money, uh, is a payment for your time for, for basically making up for accepting goods in the future that you would prefer to have in the in the present. Right. And that seems pretty adequate to me as an explanation for why interest exists. She sure what the mystery is. She is in well, her what she is responding to is uh, the person who sees no difference between, uh, so I, I think she's most interested in returns on investment and the person who sees no categorical distinction between uh, a profit sharing arrangement where if the investment goes well, then you get to take a bit of the profits and interest on the back of the strength of a loan, just like saying, I don't care what happens, you owe me 3% a year, whatever the hell it is, right? Um, the, uh, the, the um, being blind to that difference is what she wants to uncover. And the stuff about the history at the beginning is an attempt to make clear why it would have been evident to someone like Aquinas that there is something fishy, let's say, about merely getting a return on the strength of a loan, as opposed to some sort of profit sharing scheme. I mean, the way that I understand you know, the, the history of modern economic thought basically since the 1870s, the marginal revolution forward is that the time preference theory of interest is a major development and it is adequate. I mean, I think there are, there are, I mean, again, let's go back to the first day, right? We want to avoid monocausal explanations. There, there are multiple explanations for why interest exists, but I think many people recognize the fact of the preference for future good. I mean, pre the preference for present goods and that if you're going to um, 
sacrifice present goods for future consumption, you're owed something for in, in compensation. It's just, I, I mean, yeah, I guess. This is, yeah, this I, is, I mean, if she was familiar with that, I can't imagine that. I, I can't imagine that she would have. Endure, I, that, that gives me something to think about. Uh, um, is the preference for present goods stated as like a fact of rationality or something like that? Stated as a, and it is a fact. We prefer things now to the future. I mean, I would rather have $100 now than $100 a year from now. Yeah. If okay. I give you $100. You need to compensate me for my my giving up of the of present consumption. Got it. Um, huh. Okay. She does have in, in intention. There is plenty of, she was interested in the metaphysics of the future and the fact that we could die at any time or the world could blow up at any time, which would be a reason to prefer things to the present rather than the future. I, I want to cast aspersions on philosophers, but it just strikes me as the sort of thing that like economists, economists have solved and philosophers are all up in their heads about things that are not, I mean, <laughs> Of course, there's a fascinating historical aspect of how these attitudes have changed and what Aquinas thought about this and what Aristotle thought about this. And but you know, there's also the fact that she's in Cambridge, which means her vision of what how the economy functions is, is probably a Keynesian vision, which is not a general theory of the economy. It's a it's a very specific theory of particular circumstances, despite how Keynes described his book. So I would think that she's not being given the best economic advice if she's looking at people like Keynes and Srafa. Nick? This is a, I mean, going back to the problem of how does quanta be here, I think it's important to go back to something that you mentioned the first day, the question of time. I mean, for the ancients, time doesn't happen without something happening in time. One of the great revolutions, when I mean, you see this in, doc, in, in Newton's Principia, the idea that time occurs independently of any motion. Right in the Principia, there is a flow of time, and because there is a continuous flow of time, which is infinitely divisible, then he understands laws of motion. So it's once you have a reversal between the relations between time and motion, or change, that then you can say, quanta will just, over time, change, even though there's nothing that actually changes. So that's the, you know, Benjamin Franklin, time is money. So that's a sense in which I think you need a different conception of time, where time is a kind of motion where nothing changes. And that's the, you know, going back to our theme, you know, that's the conceptual revolution of early modern physics. Again, it's stated most clearly in Newton's Principia, time flows, and that flow is not a change that is quantifiable in the way in which we quantify all other forms of change. And of course, then money becomes the kind of abstraction which you can map on, such that if money is sitting around for a year, it's not doing anything, but it's producing something because time itself is always producing. It's always flowing in that sense. And that can be counted because that's- So I have no idea what Gus or uh, 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 Aquinas or Aristotle thought about this, but did they? Well, they can't did... because if I got for Aristotle, there is no time without change. Time follows change. Time follows right, so the change. The discussion of time or follows. Right? Okay. Um, time only occurs because something happens in time and because the news counts things. So there's no sense of time as flowing independently of things occurring in the world. But one of the key assumptions for the launch of modern physics, I mean, Newtonian physics, um, is the idea that, again, it's in the Principia, time flows. And as Newton says, time is a uniform, infinitely divisible flow. And that's the premise that you need then to then have all the laws of motion. And what philosophically what that means is that's the modern conceptual revolution that inverts the relationship between time and change. It's no longer that time follows change, i.e. there has to be an actual change of quantity in order for there to be time that occurs. Now time occurs in order for us to be able to a certain quantification change. This is gonna be a total aside, but is this why Hume spent so much time in the treatise arguing against that view because this was such a revolutionary yeah, I mean, thought? I mean, I mean, I mean it's, it's, it's given me a grip on like what, uh, 
should lead us to prefer Kant, the first critique to Hume, is like some of the decisive arguments he makes about the unity of thought through the atomistic conception of time that Hume presents there. But Hume himself is responding to, yeah. to Newton or things in the air well, that are Hume, Newtonian. Hume notoriously, you know, rejects Newton. Right, on this point. On, on many points. Yeah. On that point. and, and you're right that, I mean, philosophers, I mean, then philosophers try to figure out what, what this, modern physics is about. I mean, in Kant, Kant takes this like, Newtonian idea and, and sort of um, conceptualizes that the idea that time is a manifold, which is infinitely divisible. Right. This is one of the a priori you know, forms of sensibility. Um, and again, there, that changes the conception of magnitude. So there's no uniform conception of quantification or magnitude across, you know, from Aristotle, let's say, to Kant. And I think this goes back to saying that one needs to understand something about the history of physics and science. Yeah, yeah. How notions of quantification, magnitude, change that then you know percolates into changes in philosophical concepts. And my suspicion is that it also will impact our conception of money. Yeah, for sure. Um, and that actually connects up with the point that Scott was making. Um, that <clears throat> at least to me, I need to think more about how Anscombe is thinking about the future and time in order to make total sense of what she finds appealing in Aquinas um, uh, as a view that, that might be embraced. Uh, Frank, does that resonate with your views about what's um, new about capitalism and the ability to quantify and monetize time, that there's something new at and post-Newton? Does that, does that where like this is unthinkable when God owns all the time or something like that? There's a correlation between the revolution in uh, conceptualizing time and how to use time in a productive way. And to say, okay, I give you money because I want this commodity now. You can't build up a productive economy out of this. This is a, a, a zero sum game. Right. A productive economy is only if you use time productively. And that means to bring past time in a productive relation with actual time. This is the two parts which Marx tried to translate into quantitative in a, in a quantitative relation into time relation, saying already produced means of production are dead labor time, which maintain their value quantitatively because they become part of a production process in which they enter already as quantum. And the other quantum is the variable part. This is a commodity labor power, which has already produced this means of production and can add more during time, during the labor and the reproduction process of capitalist relation can produce the quantum which justify something like interest, credit, and all these kinds of relations. And the rate of interest is defined by the productivity of these two components of the capitalist process. So this is a totally different investment from saying, ah, I want this commodity now. Can you uh, give me some money? I give you more back. This on the large scale does not create a productive um, economy. And this is why it was against time, against the time that belongs to the law. And when time is an, so in Newton's sense, something like an independent, I don't know, axiomatic uh, existing, so, so to say, this is a totally different conception um, of time. And this is why these two revolutions, in a way, have to go hand in hand. What, whoever was first, um, if, if, Capitalist social relations were first, and then come up Newton, and then the church. Vice versa, it doesn't matter. They have to go hand in hand. Okay, thank you all. This is awesome. Really appreciate it.